Hello and welcome to Diminishing Returns. This week, we're gearing ourselves up for the release of Kong Skull Island by looking at the history of King Kong, which gives us, amongst other things, a fascinating journey through the changing techniques of visual effects over the last 80 years of cinema. Quite a lot of spoilers in this one, though, so here we go. This episode contains spoilers for... The Lost World, 1925, King Kong, 1933, Son of Kong, Godzilla, 1954, King Kong vs. Godzilla, King Kong, 1976, King Kong Lives, Escape from the Planet of the Apes, Little Shop of Horrors, 1986, Jurassic Park 2, Deep Blue Sea, The Powerpuff Girls Movie, King Kong 2005, Prometheus, and The Wolverine. Enjoy! Hello, welcome to Diminishing Returns, the podcast where we look at films, slag them off a bit, and then pitch our own ideas to how to make them better. That's pretty much it, right? Uh, I'm Alan. I'm here with Calvin. Hello. And Sol. Yeah. Right. And this week, <laughs> we're going to be looking at the history of King Kong, the eighth wonder of the world. <laughs> yes, uh, you're, you're a real Carl Denham, aren't you, Alan, with uh, that voice? So uh, uh, I think we're going to look at the whole kind of history in general. I mean, I oh. personally, I've, I watched the three major iterations, so uh, 1933, 76, Scene. and 2005. Scene. Scene. Mm. Yes, they're the ones I looked at. Oh. But there's, yeah, there have been a few sequels, a few Godzilla uh, spin-offs. Scene. So have you watched them all, Sol? Uh, I think I think so. I haven't seen. Um, I think there was some like sequel to the possibly the seventies one where it's got like Mecha Kong. King or Kong Lives. Uh, yeah, no, I think I have seen them all apart from King Kong Lives. That is the only one that I have not. I've even I've seen okay. King Kong versus Godzilla and King Kong Escapes. So Son none of, of us Kong. have seen King Kong Lives. So let's just pretend that one doesn't exist. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, it's hard to get on DVD. It's like, I, if if they made it available, I probably would have watched it. Um, but yeah, should we talk a little bit about the uh, the very first Kong, the nineteen thirty three King Kong? Yeah, yeah. Well, my what what really sort of piqued my interest was the fact that this is, in terms of those kind of that the monster features and the horror of the time and 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 all that, it was an original concept and it was a film yeah. concept it wasn't based on literature it wasn't based on I was just about history to ask or that. anything like that it was just yeah. mary and cooper's original idea thought this will look really cool it'll be a big spectacle on the screen Boom. Mm. and so i think it's really a, perhaps one of the first film icons of that, <laughs> of that kind well, do you know what you you mentioned Marion C. Cooper then, who has the story credit along with Edgar Wallace? But do you know what his uh, very first original idea was going to be for the film? Uh, giant moth. No, he, well, <laughs> yeah, but how he was going to achieve that was the interesting thing. He was oh, a gorilla a a... with peanut butter on its lips. <laughs> kind of worse and, than that. And dwarves. <laughs> kind, <laughs> kind of, kind of worse. He was going to. His, the plan was to travel. Marionette to... puppets and the <laughs> chimp. No, the plan. The plan was to travel to Africa and pick up all these like giant gorillas and then take them to the Komodo put, Islands. Put them the really Komodo... close in front of the camera and have all the actors standing really far away in the background. The, like the Komodo dragon was seen as like a exotic, like oh this dinosaur thing. So the plan was basically to get a get get a gorilla and a Komodo <laughs> dragon, put them on a miniature set, and just watch, see what happens, film film it. Hopefully they'll fight a bit. <laughs> I'd, I'd watch that. That's the uh, raw uh, idea. Yeah, of, uh, <laughs> <making> <laughs> Fortunately, no, no one let him do that. So we got the special effects extravaganza instead. So, uh, looking at that, I mean that, that 1933 original. I mean, it's still iconic, and obviously, it spawned remakes and things like that. But everyone, regardless of the remakes, they they know King Kong. It's his famous character, mm, mm, mm. and it has got ex an extraordinary legacy, really, hasn't it? To say it was this kind oh, of yeah. from 1933. There's not many films mm. that really hold that kind of weight so many years later. Yeah, just talking about how iconic it is. I mean, there are several. Often when I see a film and it's not necessarily the greatest film in the world, but I really enjoy it, I'll I'll say that it it ticked a lot of boxes for me, just things that personally mm -hmm. seem to hack my brain into making me like something and and examples of that would be spontaneous musical numbers, zombies, <laughs> uh <laughs> or time travel, 
all that sort of stuff. None uh, of those are in this film. <laughs> yes, but one thing that is on that list very prominently is if in the third act you have a giant being that climbs up a skyscraper and is attacked by aeroplane type things. Well, this <laughs> so is, well, anything that has that in is copying this. Uh, yeah, anything <laughs> that spoofs the ending of King Kong, essentially, it is like, that. that is one of my personal, like, that really does it for me. So this is the originator of your little fetish in film? Yeah, stuff like the Powerpuff Girls movie, uh, <laughs> Little Shop of Horrors, the, the 80s version did it to an extent. Um, huh. <laughs> Was um was Kong the first film to do that? Because I'm not sure if any of you have seen The Lost World, which was I think 1925. Yeah. That was a stop motion. It was a very similar thing. A bunch of explorers go to this, you know, a, a prehistoric land, and they bring back a dinosaur which goes crazy in London. I think I've not seen it in years. Um, it certainly doesn't oh, really? climb a skyscraper, but it does. It marches around London, and it was it was the I same ha- animator, I Willis that. O'Brien. I have seen that, but it's been a long, 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 long time. I yeah. can't remember much of it. But it is a very similar mm. um, sort of thing. It's a stop motion, yeah. dinosaurs, you know, humans wandering around saying, oh, look at that. Mm. Apparently, um, Marion C. Cooper also co-directed the film and co-produced it. Uh, and uh, by all accounts in like the documentaries I saw, he was very much the Carl Denham character in the film, mm. but in real mm. life, this yeah. Hollywood movie producer adventurer, like yeah, well, no, but kind of, kind of you know an adventurer. Like he mm. he wants to go out into <laughs> the wild and shoot things. They, they showed some silent films that he did, like when they were traveling around, I don't know, the Congo or something, and there's this incredible shot of, they needed a tiger that's sort of, like, coming up at the camera, and there were no, like, zoom lenses or anything back in those days, so he literally, like, just climbed up a tree with a camera and, like, started throwing, like, rocks at this tiger, and the tiger started climbing up the tree, and that's how they got the shot, and the ca- the tiger's, like, right in front of the lens, it's amazing footage. And then they shot it. When it got too uh, well, well, <laughs> I, I, I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the cavalier <laughs> attitude towards uh, the natural world as we go on in our discussion of the film. I think, but yes, I don't think Mary St. Mary and C. Cooper was especially environmentally concerned. <laughs> well, this is one thing that I found very interesting about watching these three different versions. In that they take place in very okay, they don't take place in different times, but they were made in very different times. Mm. And obviously the f- the most notable difference there is the way that they achieve the visual effects, but also mm. the kind of moral tone of it and the, and the way that the, the creature is um, presented and, and uh, dealt with by the other characters. I thought it was really interesting to see that change in the way that kind of socially mm. we've changed uh, on what's acceptable now. Mm. But f- mm. first, shall we talk about the effects in... Well, basically how they created a giant gorilla and dinosaur fights in 1933. Yeah, shall we? So, well, to put it simply, it's stop motion animation, right? (laughs) Yes, yes, it is. Um, Willis O'Brien was the lead animator on it, and he had the armatures of uh, gorillas and dinosaurs, some of which were left over from other projects. I think one of them might have even been left over from uh, The Lost World. I just want to ask a quick question of you, Calvin, because now mm. I know I know you've done a, a, a bit of stop motion animation. You made a short film yes. at university with stop motion, and I'm just curious, like on a scale of one to ten, when you're doing that, how much do you want to kill yourself? <laughs> <laughs> because it seems like the most tedious, the mind-numbing thing that I could possibly imagine. Yeah, you did I mean... go. You did go a bit funny, didn't you, Calvin? <laughs> Me? I yeah, I, when, what, I, I was living with you when you were filming that and going there every day for however many hours a day, and you were. It was about five months of it. Yeah, I... you you were you were kissing your little puppet on the head every night and saying <laughs> good night, Vernon, and putting him to bed <laughs> in a little box. I don't know if I was quite um, doing that. <laughs> you, you were you were saying good night to it every day. <laughs> I, I still refer to them as like him and her and stuff. It's like yeah, you do get you do grow a bit of attachment to those models. But no, I mean for for the listeners who might not necessarily know what stop motion animation is, uh, it's basically when you have a model and you take a still image of it. And then you move it a little bit, take another still image, and move it again, take another still image, and then when you put all those images together, it creates the illusion of movement. Should we explain breathing, in case any listeners uh, are <laughs> wondering about that as well? No, I'm, I'm sure some of the some of the youths listening, some of our, our younger demographic, uh, 
probably <laughs> not familiar with movie effects being created with plastic. I mean, if you, if you go to YouTube, look at Bride of Vernon. That's just a very good example of that. Is a know, perfect example of stop motion animation. I think. It is. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I, but so, but, so <laughs> you made a you made what is that like a fifteen minute film? It took you five yes. months. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, how many uh, frames per second were you doing? Because you cheated a bit, right? Uh, yeah, it was like 12. You can get away with 12. And for King Kong, I don't know how much exactly they use. I think it differs from shot to shot. I was going to say, uh, it, it's from that era when like hand crank cameras were <laughs> involved and the frame rate differs like throughout the film anyway. So yeah. you can oh, really yeah. tell on the... Yeah, on the yeah exactly. Um, I think stop motion animation would come a long way in the next few years like there there was another big ape film that Willis O'Brien did the stop motion ape for which was Mighty Joe Young mm. and uh, when you look at the stop motion in that it's significantly better than it is in King Kong which is a bit ropey at times I think we can agree what film is it where instead of using stop motion animation they just get like a gecko and like glue some scales like some things to its back to make it look a bit is more that, dinosaurish is that the one Ross watches in that episode of Friends I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's very old school. It's like there's, there's like a load Kong of cavemen there. like throwing spears at uh, an iguana. And, yeah, and, there well, is yeah, um, something like that. Well, one of the Japanese Kong films. I can't remember which one it is now, but um, there is a bit where they have like you know a, a sea monster comes out of the sea and attacks a village, and it's just an octopus <laughs> that they just like shove on the set, and it moves around a little bit, and that's it. Um, well, that's that's the the very first Godzilla has just an octopus comes and attacks everyone for no reason, but it's it's <laughs> it's like a an actual special effect. It isn't just an octopus that they're. It's not just a man in a rubber suit kicking an octopus. <laughs> but I do think um, just before we move on from talking about the special effects, I do think that there's a lot of really great stuff in here, and it's not just an actor in front of a you know a back projection of a stop motion dinosaur running at it. There are some shots which are quite amazing. Which is Fay Ray is in the life real fey ray is in like uh, this giant uh, life-sized hand of kong being held mm. and the stop motion kong is in the foreground peeling off her clothes mm. in you know the live action bit and just having to work all that out like obviously her clothes were being pulled off by a wire in the live action footage but then to impose the model in front and have it animate is really mm. lovely and when he like he picks her up and puts her in a cave at one point, and then she, you know, it's the live action Fay Ray again, and how they achieved that by having all these little stills of her and then just changing mm. them um, as they mm. animated to create the illusion of movement. And even it's quite remarkable. The back, pro- the back projection work, even that, some of it's a bit more sort of obvious, but some of it works really nicely, and they've kind of got, they've still got plants in the foreground and things like that, a second oh, yeah. scene, and it's kind of in the background. Yeah. It, they, they do it quite nicely in some of it, and then mm. sometimes it's like them walking on a conveyor belt in front of a moving screen. Yeah, which isn't as great. <laughs> I mean, yeah. all, all the effects were incredible by the standards of 1933, but mm. they're all they're all very primitive and basic and, and shit by today's standards so with that in mind <laughs> they still they hold up in the sense of you kind of see it from the time you know you look at it diagnostically yeah. like yeah of that as an artifact of the time it's fine but i i mean obviously nothing from pff, you you can't really go further back than maybe about 1968 and have like a film compete with a modern film in terms of its special effects you go in 1968 because a Planet of the Apes came out in 1968. <laughs> that, that is, yeah. Are we judging special effects by how the real, the level of realism involved? Because I, I, I genuinely yeah. think that the 33 King Kong looks better than the 70s Kong when it's just a well, bloke we'll in a suit. Well, we'll get to that in a bit. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the point I was leading to, and and I don't want to take away from the artistry because I mean I I I really like 1933's King Kong. Um, mm. For the record, I, I think it's great, but obviously it's very dated in terms of its effects because it's from the 30s. So, with that in mind, how does the writing hold up? How how does the story <laughs> hold up? Yeah, I'm happy we're moving on to this because uh, yeah. the story is pretty much jettisoned about halfway through in favor of <laughs> special effects. Uh, but for about 45 minutes, there's a bit of something there, isn't there? Yeah. Shall I tell you what my my favourite thing about the whole film was, the 1933 version, was the way that everybody spoke, that 30s slang. <laughs> and I was like, ah, oh, gee, this dame's really swell. It was like, oh, it was so great. And I, I, that yeah. was really missing in the Peter Jackson version for me, because they set it in the same time period, but it didn't have that. 
No, um, I, like, I, Jack I, Black like, tries I really to felt do like that it a did. little bit. Oh, I needed yeah. so much more, though. But the, the 30s one, it, is, it feels so genuine, like because I think that was just the way they were Well, because it was. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, it was just, it, it, it was fantastic. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure everyone knows the story of King Kong, but just to point out the bleeding obvious, um, it is about a movie producer called Carl Denham, who uh, he wants to go to this faraway land. He got this map from someone somewhere in Shanghai or wherever, which uh, apparently leads to this amazing island where all these giant creatures live. He wants to make a movie there, but he can't find an actress, so he plucks a a, a thief off the street and uh, takes her along. Only her, bearing in mind. Um, I don't know. (laughs) There's no other cast cast for this film. (laughs) No other cast or crew. Just him, a camera, and her, and a bunch of surly (laughs) seamen. And, uh, yeah, I've seen a few films like that. <laughs> and, um, and one of them falls in love with the uh, with the lady, and when they go to the island, there are some natives there who kidnap the lady and then sacrifice her to Kong. And the story pretty much ends there because the next forty five minutes are them trying to get her back. They take Kong back to New York, and then you know he wreaks havoc. Um, and and their 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 plan with that is essentially I I do love that their whole thing is like the third the 1933 platform for showing off this eighth wonder of the world is you put him on stage like on <laughs> on Broadway or whatever it is and people pay to go and sit in a chair and just look at it for. <laughs> You know what I love? I love the people. Well, they they show all the people coming into the auditorium, and like most of them are being like, "What are we even seeing?" And like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's something something that Carl Denham got. Yeah, I don't know. It's like people have paid. To the come previews out got Saturday. rave reviews. <laughs> <laughs> so like no one even knows what they're coming to see. What I like about in in all versions of the film is that it's never explained how they got him on the ship, how they got him off the ship into the theatre without <laughs> anyone noticing. <laughs> like, there's no logistics involved here whatsoever. And and for the for the two people who who haven't seen the film, I suppose just to to spoil it, um, it ends with Kong going on a, a rampage around New York, and then they they ultimately kill Kong, and uh, then movie producer man walks up and says the iconic line, "It was beauty killed the beast." Mm. And now, can I? I I feel like the film's trying to say something about the guy's hubris there or something but i don't really know what it is mm. that's well, a really that, iconic moment that's so am i because, am i missing it <laughs> well i i basically my conclusion after watching sort of three different versions of the film is that there's no message that's uh, that's I'm the trying thing. to figure out yeah. what what is it a metaphor for what's the analogy um who's learning a lesson who's cha- and nothing and, unless <laughs> the metaphor just... is purely like guys stop thinking with your dick all the time it's going <laughs> to get you into trouble yes <laughs> Yes. Mm. Well, that's what I was trying to think. What is Kong uh, supposed to be? What does Kong represent? Because even if Marion C. Cooper just created it as a spectacle, there must be some subconscious thing that's going on here, a Freudian oh, well, thing that's happening. I was going to say, the there's moment. there's obviously the uh, the infamous allegations of racial subtext well, and you know racist I mean, subtext. Do you know what? But... That's, I mean, from a 1933 film, I was expecting a lot more racism. Um, and it was, <laughs> it was, I was a little bit disappointed that they had, they had actual black people playing black people, which was very disappointing. <laughs> um, and because they're a kind of tribe off in the middle of nowhere, you can get away with doing whatever. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, I, I don't think it's nearly yeah. as bad as it might be. No, but yeah, what you say about the racial, like he, the, this, this giant, well, ape man kind of is not quite a gorilla he's mm. kind of a in, in the 30s version he's got human qualities and he is the king of this tr- tribe of black people basically yeah. so in that sense it's like they they go the white man goes and takes the strongest and, and biggest and brings him back and enslaves yeah. him so that's kind of thing and then he breaks out runs amok grabs the the white woman <laughs> the metaphor doesn't go hey this is a bad thing to do <laughs> the metaphor goes and look Look what happens when you try and get them into society. They just don't know how to act. So <laughs> if if you go with that if you go with that route, then it's not very sensitive. This is a criticism often aimed at the original King Kong, and I I don't know what what do you make of it? Because I, I don't I certainly don't think there was any conscious yeah I don't like, think the stuff intent going is there. on. I, yeah. What I find more interesting is uh, the idea that it Kong is basically an analogy or a representation of 
just physical primal uh, yeah uh, maybe behavior yeah. lust and aggression and kind of particularly masculine be- uh, primal behaviors and so yeah. that is tamed by a woman and that's tamed by love um that's mm. i think that's what it's supposed to be it um, is really weird that he's into that woman though isn't it i never quite <laughs> <laughs> i always i always kind of take it as she's like the first white blonde thing he's ever seen i think it's purely <laughs> Aesthetic, you know. So um, they they, they try they try to make it um, overt in the Peter Jackson one, where he's picking up yeah. all these blonde women that look like her and then tossing her away. Um, but could we talk a little bit about the love story? Because I hear like whenever I hear like big filmmakers like Peter Jackson or whatever talking about King Kong and how influential it was and all this, they always talk about the love story and about how mm. Fay Ray's character, the one who he takes up to the top of the Empire State Building, is actually in love with him as well, and that she's crying at the end because she's so upset <laughs> that this magnificent beast is dead. I get none of that in the film. She yeah, is terrified I, I in every yeah, she's, single she... scene. <laughs> There's a lot of reasons to be crying that aren't yes. because you're in love with the with the ape that yes. just like like you've just been held in the the hands of a gigantic like beast as it climbs hundreds <laughs> of feet into the sky. <laughs> and you know, she may maybe she's sad on a purely, you know, the the innocent animal got killed. I mean, that that's still reason enough to be sad. That doesn't mm. mean that she's in love with the thing. She's fucking crying it, the whole way through the film. <laughs> just, that character yeah. is so annoying and the 70s one is even worse <laughs> but but yeah in, in the in the peter jackson version that's much more uh explicit the the fact that and arrow does obviously feel something for the creature and sympathize mm. with them at least oh yes but what i found interesting about that and what we were just saying about it being a manifestation of masculinity is that the point where naomi watts's andaro sort of switches and, be- and starts to go oh right he's not trying to hurt me and now i like him is mm. when he fights off the dinosaur and mm. saves her basically and protects her mm. and so that was this kind of like what does this mean so this is like this overly masculine guy and she doesn't like it and she's scared by it but then ultimately she feels nurtured and protected by it um, hmm. And I, I don't, I don't really like, like think much of that message, really. Um. Hmm. Um, while I don't think that the character Andaro necessarily has much sympathy for Kong um, when it's uh, t- you know killing people around New York and trying to get her away from everything, um, I, I do think that Kong is animated really well, and I do think that Willis O'Brien gives a lot of character mm. to the thing, which I'm. Yeah. It would surprise me if that was an executive order, uh, if that was just Willis O'Brien like thinking, well, this is a character, and I, I think you do really sympathise with him at the end when the planes are shooting at him, and he looks at his bloody his hand, and he's, like, really sad. And There are some very nice little character moments in there, where there's a bit when he first takes Fay Ray back to his cave, and he puts her up on her thing, and he turns his back, and there's, like, a snake monster that's coming to get her, and he turns around and fights it off. But the thing that's distracted him is that he's, like, looking down at a little flower. And the, the, the idea is that, oh, is he going to give that to Andaro? Is that what... You know, it wasn't just he's turned his back for the sake of nothing. They were processing... Well, so Brian was processing the character motivations of King Kong mm. throughout every scene, and I think it really shows and pays off. Yeah, Even cool. when he's, like, yeah. just dropping random New York women from windows. Because he kills a lot of people. <laughs> he kills so yes. many people in this film. <laughs> It is kind of hard to be sympathetic. <laughs> <laughs> but I like yeah. that. It feels like, yeah, he doesn't even think of them as concept of life. It's just like, yeah, what's this? Yeah. Oh, nothing. Throw it away. Oh, yeah. He's like, he is just a proper loose, untamed animal. Uh, yeah. Which is, I, I think everyone that's come after this has tried to give him some kind of, you know, um, anthropomorphized personality or uh, ideals or whatever. But at the end of the day, he is of just a massive wild animal that's going to stamp on you if you get in his way. <laughs> I mean, we, we've we not really... Just, do you two like the film? <laughs> oh! Yeah, I enjoy it, um, and I I think it lacks deeper meaning to really make it a great yeah. film, but yeah, it's yeah. a watchable story, and yeah. I like in the 30s version, I like as a kind of historical document. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I like it more in my memory than I do when I actually sit down and watch it, is <laughs> yeah. how I have to, you know. It is like, very much a, f- a film where I, I like select highlights, and I suppose, like you say, I kind of remember the best bits. But, I mean, I, I do yeah. I do like it. 
but it, mm. it is kind of as a historical artifact more than a, a piece of outright entertainment. Oh, I think it's very entertaining, but yeah. uh, again, I don't know if it's just... Uh, I, I watched it, I, come, I must come back to it like every two years or something, and I always sort of, my memory of it, I don't know if I look back at it through rose-tinted glasses, because I saw it when I was a much younger kid, and obviously when you see it when you're a kid, you're enthralled with the stop motion, and then you think, oh god, well, I can make my own, you know, with a camera or whatever, and... <laughs> That's what I think when I saw it as a you. kid, it was it was just like, oh, so this is what that Simpsons episode was doing. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> can we can we move on to the sequel? Yes, sure. let's. I, I, uh, well, I haven't seen it, so go on. Ah, okay. I, I don't well, really know anything about it. So, well, the same year, mm. um, the Son of Kong was released, mm. and I don't I don't know quite how that worked. If they just turned it around really quickly, or if they yeah started work <laughs> on it before the first one was even out or what but it's it's like a it's like a weird comedic extension it it is a comedy isn't it It, it's it's very odd yeah yeah there isn't as much uh action really or stop motion effects i don't think it's and i don't know if part of that was to to do with the time like they just didn't Mm. have the time to do all the animation they wanted to do because it was rushed into production it, it, it must have literally been right. This has been a huge success. We want the next film out in three months. What have you got? What stock footage have we got? Throw something together, <laughs> yeah, and put the name Kong on it, and we'll sell it. That's all. That's that's all it was. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's not. It's not very good, <laughs> Son of it, Kong. It, to be honest, it's, it's it is pretty. It, it picks up very not too long after King Kong, and it has Carl Denham, who's uh, he has a number of lawsuits against him now because of <laughs> everything everything that he caused. In to be honest, like reading the synopsis of it, it does sound like something that one of us would pitch. Um, <laughs> yeah, because you know Carl Denham, he leaves New York with um, the captain, comes back from the. The uh, first film, along with Charlie, the um, racist Chinese stereotype. Who, oh, uh, I forgot about him. <laughs> well, I was very yeah, happy to see that Peter there. Jackson decided to put keep that character in <laughs> in 2005. <laughs> he did, didn't he? <laughs> um, anyway, and then they they make, they get caught up with some uh, dame, and uh, they end up back on. Skull Island, and there is an albino ape who isn't actually that big. He must only be like what ten foot, something yeah, like that. Yeah, it's very disappointing. That's what I remember is that yeah, the, the, it's is, is it even twice as tall as a human in the film? Mm. It's a, it's not much yeah, bigger than a person from what I remember. It's not very yeah, it's not very big at all. But um, they they call him Little Kong, I think, and mm. the, the, it's just sort of an adventure on the island, and they come across like treasure at some point. And that's going to make them all rich. So that's the end. And that's basically the, the <laughs> film. Interesting about the size there, because what size is Kong in that first film? He's well, he changes. It's inconsistent, isn't it? Yeah. 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 I mean, if you look at the posters, he's bigger than the majority of New York City in some <laughs> of the posters. But... No, I think it was just basically they had different sized models and uh, different sized <laughs> environments to put the same model in. So it just yeah. it's just all over the place. Just... But uh, as far as Son of Kong goes, I, I would say give it a miss unless you're <laughs> actually, yeah. you know, genuinely you know, are a Kong completist. Because <laughs> otherwise there's nothing really to be to be gained from it i don't think uh but then then the next uh king kong film was king kong versus godzilla wasn't it in the 60s yes. so yes. so 30 years after um mm. the the last ones and uh yeah i, I adore godzilla I, I think it's wonderful um and it's i mean i won't go too deep into this because it will probably do an episode on it at some point but if you ever watch the um sequels to godzilla it is incredible how quickly it goes from a very legitimate earnest attempt at filmmaking to just a load of nonsense with people like <laughs> doing power rangers basically like whacking yeah. each other in, in big suits it's, it's literally the second film it just becomes <laughs> like a load of nonsense and i think wow. king kong versus godzilla was only like the fourth godzilla film something like that oh, it was quite early on but godzilla was was all about crossover movies um yeah. most of the iconic godzilla villains are are film characters in their own right who i think the studio just owned the rights to them and just threw them into a godzilla film afterwards because they thought well that's how did king kong end up here because he can't be public domain there is a bit of a history in the legal ownership of king kong actually oh really basically rko made the original they licensed it to a japanese company to make the godzilla films 
And then Miriam C. Cooper found out and, and sued and claimed that King Kong was his creation and his his uh, copyright ownership, but that he had licensed it to RKO to make King Kong. Mm. Um, and so it was a whole back and forth, and this was all happening while they were making the 1976 version of it. And so mm. it was all settled so that they could release that film, basically. I mean, there, there's a rich history of Japan just taking things and inexplicably turning them into monsters based on giant monsters with the same name. That there's a whole series of like Frankenstein movies from Japan that are about a gigantic monster that kaiju that battles, you know, other gigantic monsters, but it's called Frankenstein. Mm. And it's it's like meant to be Frankenstein's monster or something. It's it's very <laughs> bizarre, but. Um, Hmm. But so, have, have you seen Godzilla vs. Uh, King Kong, Kevin? Yes, Kevin? I owned the DVD at one point. Uh, <laughs> really? Yes, oh, I should say I, I owned the um, the American version of it, which was dubbed yeah, and yes. re-edited, <laughs> so it wasn't even the case of changing the language, it was just, nope, this is what mm. you get. Uh, yeah, not very good, is it? Not really, no. But uh, then, I, I'm not a fan of these kinds of, like you say, it's basically Power Rangers, isn't it? It's just, yeah, we're going to get yeah. two it, men it, in suits to yeah. fight in a miniature set, and there we go. Yeah, I, I will say, King Kong vs. Godzilla is very representative of the kaiju genre. It's a very good example of what the genre has to offer. If I recall correctly, King Kong vs. Godzilla, King Kong inexplicably becomes powerful when he absorbs electricity and mm. i think he gets struck by lightning at some point and that makes him super powerful and <laughs> and yeah, yeah. It, it just does boil down to a man in a rubber suit uh dressed as king kong no stop start animation in this one and a man dressed as godzilla just kicking each other for <laughs> the majority of the film and well, the the weird thing with these Japanese King Kong films is you would have thought that they would have um, been something of a something of a warning to American producers that perhaps the uh, rubber suit approach to special effects isn't the the best way of doing it. Mm. Um, and yet, a good like ten twenty years on, they they did remake King Kong in Hollywood, um, mm. the nineteen seventy six version, and and they used the same weird rubber suit effects um, <laughs> for for the monster and it 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 looks shit <laughs> mm. so yeah uh, am i right well, in thinking we've all seen 76 yes. king kong yes with yes. uh jeff bridges yeah there are differences in the 70s version because they do update it to the 70s but then mm. it sort of sets out as if it's going to be different. So instead of going to make a film, they're going there searching for oil. But then it basically just follows the exact same steps and does exactly the same thing anyway. And then it make, but then it makes less sense when Charles Godin, who plays the the kind of the Carl Denham character, he just becomes this kind of entertainment impresario, like instead of an oil executive. Whereas like Carl Denham, the produce film producer, putting on a show with a giant ape and this P.T. Barnum kind of ca- carnival atmosphere makes sense. But when the mid-management oil executive suddenly becomes this, <laughs> <laughs> like, carnival barker, it doesn't make any yeah. sense. Mm. It's not great. I mean, <laughs> no, so no. That's, that's all I've got to say about it. So, really. I mean, yeah, in, in terms of the plot, it's basically the same. We already talked about that. But what about the, what about the effects? So, basically, yeah. in this version, Kong is rendered as a man in a suit. Yes. Oh, yeah. uh, Rick Baker, for most of the thing, I think. Uh, Rick Baker, the famous uh, makeup artist. But, uh, I don't know, I, uh, it is a very of its time, but I don't know, it works to an extent, doesn't it? I think the, the, the sort of the facial stuff works nicely because it feels yeah. quite expressive and there's mm. more of an emotional connection there, I think. I should say, I, I do have quite a soft spot for the, the rubber suit, but they do look a bit shit. <laughs> um <laughs> If I'm trying to be objective about it, <laughs> and uh, and apparently they, they they were trying to make like an actual kind of giant robotic gorilla thing. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, <laughs> and um, wow. they kind of had one guy working on that, and then they had Rick Baker working on the man in a suit kind of idea, and sort of see which one would work better. And mm. uh, you know, the robot didn't work very well <laughs> but they spent a oh, lot of money on it. I think it's in a it. picture of that, you know. It's in the film. Yeah. It's, it's all, it gets about a minute of screen time apparently. They do use parts oh. of it. But also they did build like the robotic arms and stuff. So the the same company or whoever it was created it. 
I can understand the um, desire to remake it, actually, from a producing point of view. If, if you think, you know what, we're, we've got the technology to just build a gigantic ape and film it. Thinking in terms of how it looked and how they made it and, and, and the sense of all that, bear in mind that that, yeah. that came out the year after Jaws. And Ooh. Jaws really changed the game. Yeah. Uh, and I think perhaps, because presumably King Kong would have been already being made by that point and certainly scripted and, and the costumes mm. and all that sort of thing. So they didn't have time to change it. And it, it made me think of it because Jeff Bridges' character really reminded me of Richard Dreyfuss yeah. in Jaws. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And I think maybe if King Kong had come out two years earlier, it might have been a more successful. Well, how how successful was the seventies film, like purely financially speaking? Well, from from what I gathered on Wikipedia, it, it was like the fifth highest grossing film of the year. But I, it's well, got it must no have put some money of... into it though. Oh yeah, yeah. But I mean, it made, it made a good hmm. bit of money. Uh, it, yeah. it just hasn't really held up. And when you say King Kong, no one. <laughs> no one would first think, oh yes, Jeff Bridges and Jessica yeah. Lang on top of the World Trade yeah. Center. Um, uh, and then was was King Kong Lives the sequel to the seventy six version? It yes. was. It was made ten years later, at the end of you know the remake of King Kong. King Kong falls off the building and dies. But apparently he was just been kept in alive in a coma for ten years, and then they give him an artificial heart. And there's a female Kong in this, or rather, a female giant gorilla. Um, oh. I think there's a baby Kong as well at some point, <laughs> if I remember correctly. Oh, a whole family of Kongs. Yeah. Well, hmm. like I say, it didn't didn't look worth uh, anyone's time, to be honest. <laughs> well, it's very odd that they chose to do it ten years after the uh, the first one. Again, mm. it's quite interesting that now, coming to Skull Island, they seem to be making a real conscious attempt to keep get a Kong franchise going, which yeah. they've just never really seemed to get to do in the past. They make, like, two yeah, films, and, and then they kind of, eh, I'm not going to And even now, I don't anymore. quite know, like, how well that's going to go down. Do you, yeah. Did you... Did you see when they um, they premiered the trailer at Comic Con and it was a surprise announcement and it was meant to be this big, oh my god, they're making a King Kong film. Oh my god, you know, no one, oh. you know, when they drop a surprise trailer in and people mm. go wild for it, uh, and they played the trailer and no one really had a clue what was going on. No one knew if it was a sequel to the Peter Jackson film. No one knew if it was a reboot, mm. and it didn't really have the effect they were hoping for. It was this very befuddled reaction because no one really mm. knew what to make of it they were just like oh okay yeah. mm, interesting well if it, even if it i mean it's set in the 70s so even if it's trying to make it as a sequel it's gonna amount to nothing more than hey remember that giant gorilla we found the island that it came from let's go there and have mm. a look so. <laughs> I, I think the teaser was just like shots of an island or something and then the words kong skull island appeared so like yeah, people yeah. had no idea what what was going on. It's got um, a hell of a cast, though. Well, before before we start dissecting the cast of the new one, should we, should yes, we, we do should. Peter Jackson's King Kong? Yes. yes. Let's. Because um, um, this one has a real history to it, and I know this yes. because Peter Jackson loves to make incredibly long making of documentaries <laughs> and feature them on the DVD, which I watched for... Um, uh, yeah, the 2005 version and the 1933 version, which... Mm. Can I just say, you know, earlier on I mentioned the Spider Pit sequence... Yeah. Um, Peter Jackson was such a fan of it that he like spent yeah he re presumably he a remade lot of it, money it? yeah he remade it in, in as Weta. a child or something oh no 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 a the... Weta a, a Weta they made it around the time of the DVD release in 2005 oh really I I think he might have made his own spider sequence as a as a youth Ah. Um, as one of his very early, you know, playing with a video camera yes. sort of projects. And... He certainly tried to make his own version of King Kong then. He, like, he very proudly still has some of the props that he tried to use that he was making around mm. the time. And he made, like, the top of the Empire State Building. I think he might have even had his own King Kong armature uh, oh, wow. that he made himself back in the day. He was really keen to make his own version mm. even as a teenager. I mean, he he said lots of things about how, like, this was his... This was the film he wanted to make from the start and everything, wasn't mm. it? And he, yeah. he sort well, of did uh, Lord of the Rings I did to read establish his... Yeah, they were, they were trying to make <laughs> yeah. it after the Frighteners, or that was kind of what he wanted to yeah. do, and, yeah. and it's, for whatever reason it didn't quite tie together, and so... Well, it God, to God, Godzilla came out, and oh, the yeah. Mighty Joe Young remake came out, <laughs> so that that yeah. kind of put the commotion in it. But it made, it made the perfect sense to make it in the mid-90s, when you think Jurassic Park really has just did, come yeah. out... 
all these big monster movies. It makes yeah. perfect sense. But then I think it was just the studio, yeah, got cold feet. And that that time gap, that you know, eight years makes a huge mm-hmm. difference to how they could produce it. Also oh, made yes. a huge difference how much money I, they would give this this idiot yeah. for, to make this. Film. But also, also it makes a huge difference to. Um, how much leeway they give him to do whatever he wants. And I, mm. I do sort of lament the fact that he didn't get to make it in the 90s when there would have yeah. been more people watching over his shoulder and telling him to fucking pack it in. Because <laughs> cause I, I, King Kong, the 2005 version, I, I think it is a truly remarkable 90-minute film that is mm. trapped in this big, bloated, yes. three-hour body. And I, I do genuinely think someone... A talented editor could probably take that film and and you know what we're given and and just ch- chop it down and give us something great. Um, yeah, it, it's so frustrating because there's so much in that film that I love to pieces, and it, it is just this big bloated, unnecessary. But it is obviously from someone who loves the original because it's just a yeah, straight remake. Yeah, yeah. Beat by beat, but padded out to flesh out the characters a bit more, and mm-hmm. and, and it does give them a bit more edge, mm. and it makes the whole thing a bit more kind of believable yeah and then there's lots of stuff that's just not necessary at all it's a very justified beat for beat remake though insofar as you know the the advancement made in in not just special effects but just film technology i mean you know yeah i i I do think there's something to be said for for almost giving a free pass to to any film that people want to remake from the 30s because Mm. the landscape of cinema is just so different now yeah but then to still set it in the 30s. But I do think that really adds to it. I think that adds to its charm. It makes it a much more yes, interesting film. I think it excuses a lot. I was of about to say, I think from a writing. Something. Because like things where people are just falling instantly in love and they're, let's get married. Yeah. Um, it's... Oh, uh, yeah. And also, you know, they, they find their way to a an undiscovered island. Yeah. That's this massive thing. And the idea that like in today's day and age you could do that is is just laughable. We've got satellite technology looking down at the planet. It's just There are all these characters with subplots which don't go I don't go anywhere or just end unsatisfactorily. Mm. It's uh like I I guess Kyle Chandler's in there as Bruce Baxter, who's another actor in Carl Denham's film and Mm. he kinda you know, he has his thing about, you know, he's a coward, he's vain, all this, and then he comes back at the end and saves the day. Yeah, you don't see anything in between where he has to learn a lesson or or change his mind or anything. He just comes back and it's like, oh right. Yeah. But that that yeah. character is a kind of overblown. Hey, I'm the hero actor. Character works. Yeah. But trying yeah. to give him any kind of plot doesn't. You just use him as that character. Like use Andy Serkis as the kind of grumpy cook guy. You know, mm. it's just like have these little characters. You don't need to build anything yeah. around them. They're just yeah. you know they're window dressing. Should we, should we talk about Kong himself here, uh, mm-hmm. as played by motion capture uh, oh, and yes. by Andy Serkis, fresh off of. Uh... Gollum. Yeah, the, the, hmm. the fact that they they decided to go full gorilla because in the previous iterations it's it's kind of a slightly anthropomorphized you know eight giant ape with some more human characteristics, for example, mm. walking on two legs and mm. but here they went full on. He's just a gorilla, but a massive one. Yeah, um, <laughs> but then achieved it through motion capture and, mm. and Andy Circus. Went full method. I, I think he lived as a gorilla for three months. Um, <laughs> I I can't tell if you're joking. <laughs> uh, yeah, and fantastic performance. I think. I mean, I don't know much that yeah. much about gorillas, but it completely feels like a gorilla to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I, I agree. I, I I'm not a fan of the design of this particular Kong, yeah. and I think Alan, I think you might have summed it up there just because it is just a gorilla. There doesn't yeah. look to be yeah. much personality or charm to it. Like I I think watching the trailer for um, the upcoming Kong Skull Island, I think they went back to that original model and tried to. It, it's weird it with though. Sense it, of that. It, it it looks almost like a almost like a live action cartoon. It's almost like when you yeah. watch you know Garfield or the Smurfs brought into the real world. That's kind of what the new King Kong <laughs> looks like to me. It's it's <laughs> just weird. Yeah. But I, I agree. It does seem to be like they've really consciously tried to give it some personality and embrace that it isn't necessarily the most realistic looking thing in the world. Hmm. Well, well, Jackson's Kong. I mean, the the gorilla himself, Kong, fan- fantastically realized. Mm. Yeah. Rest of the effects in the film, 
a little bit forgotten about, perhaps, because they were concentrating on the... Uh, give, they give were... They were incredible when that film came out. Were they? I, mean, I, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, I remember, remember sitting that, in the yeah. cinema and being blown away by the effects in that film, and mm. and it, 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 it's kind of a a lot. So much of it's CGI, and it's sort of a a good example of why CGI isn't necessarily the most uh, timeless. <laughs> Uh, effect to use because it, it only took about two years for people to start criticizing, uh, in particular the dinosaur sequence for looking a bit the stampede ropey, yeah, yeah, yeah looking a bit ropey and it doesn't hold it well. Great. But there's a hell of a lot of um, miniature work in King Kong, which oh, yeah. which I think looks wonderful. Um, yeah. Did you not think the effects were that great, Alan? Um, some of them, I, I guess, it's just the bad ones really jump out at you. But uh, yeah, and they they recreated sad. you know 1930s New York as well with yeah like, your city scapes are usually success pretty good mm. but I mean even some of that you can it's just like you can see the seams and it's like you can mm. see where the, the the actual road ends and then the background road get like a back I mean, projection thing it's like. Or that you know yeah. when you have a matte backdrop, it just feels like that. I mean, I think it's similar to the '30s film in a lot of ways because the effects don't hold up that well there either. You know, they don't look. Well, that's real. it. I mean, do we judge more harshly because I kind of expect more from the 2005 version? I think it's, I think it's easier for models, and the more primitive the effects are, the more charming they are. So even if they mm. do look kind of crap, you're still sort of yeah uh, wrapped up in it. You you inherently feel like there's more artistry behind it when it yeah. is just a little puppet for some reason, even though. You know, I'm sure there were literally hundreds of, of very talented artists pouring their heart and soul into the digital effects on on the oh yeah 2005's film. But I'm sure, but... yeah. Another thing that struck me in in all the versions of King Kong that I watched when they have him chained up in the uh, when they're presenting him at the end and they they got him chained up. And they yes. Go, oh, don't worry, it's chrome steel chains. Um, they, those <laughs> chains always come off very easily, don't they? <laughs> in, the, in the 70s version, it literally just shakes them off. It doesn't even, like, smash them or anything. <laughs> it's just, You're right, actually. It feels like there yeah. should be more of a struggle involved. <laughs> well, they probably couldn't make realistic-looking chains that a man could actually break whilst wearing a gorilla costume for the <laughs> 70s one. I do like that in the 2005 version they actually put on a bit of a show though. It's not just like sitting there watching <laughs> yeah. the thing. They actually have dancers come out. Oh yeah, yeah. I really like that actually, yeah. Because it yeah. made more sense, didn't it? In the, yeah. Very yeah. Broad just the whole... Like, the whole operation makes more sense. Like, Cole Denham actually has a crew of, like, mm. filmmakers. And, yes. Uh, <laughs> a cameraman and another actor. Yeah. <laughs> I think that character, I think Cole Denham is the character most improved on in the remake. Because he, he yeah. does have a proper arc. And it's yeah, nice definitely. when mm. he has the moment on the stage at the end where Kong's uh, leaping out of the theatre. And he's just stood there, like, mm. devastated at everything that he's seen. And Yeah. Uh, w- which... Remake either this one or the seventies one has the most saccharine, sappy, horrible like attempt at romance between <laughs> the, the woman and Kong. Because I hate uh... it. There's a scene in the two thousand and five version of Kong when um, and uh, King Kong has got Ann Darrow in his hand and they're having this lovely moment like sliding around on a frozen pond in Central Park and it's meant to be oh, this big yeah, romantic sequence and it just mm. is so... Ugh, it's terrible. I hate it. I think the 2005 version is probably the most guilty of that, but yeah. it's still a far better you know, film regardless. That scene was added like after they made the film. In post-production, Peter Jackson was like, oh, what about if they go to like Central Park and have a really cliched first date ice skating in Central Park? When they had a two and two and three quarter hour film in yeah. post production, Peter well, Jackson went, "You know what? This needs this needs another scene here." Yeah. <laughs> I wish Peter Jackson had just fully embraced his dark side with King Kong and just said, "Like, right, it's going to be three films. <laughs> I've got enough stuff here." Because I think that'd work better in a lot of ways. You have you have the first film in Skull Island. You have your your second film with Kong running amok. I guess two films. No, 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 no. Because <laughs> that the the three chapter sequence in these films really annoyed me because it just felt so disjointed. So you got the beginning bit and then the boat journey, um, mm, yeah. and then you've got oh, the yeah, whole, course, all yeah. the Kong stuff on the 
on the island, which is a completely yeah. different tone, completely different film. Yeah. And then the uh, kind of running amok in New York, which is similar to the island, mm. but in the, in the city. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. I, I agree. And I, I you, you could get very easily a, a full film out of Skull Island antics. I haven't looked too far into what they're doing with the new film, but I assume that is the approach they're taking. It, it seems it? that way, yeah. It's going to kidnap Tom Hiddleston and take him to the top of the Chrysler building? What else in New York can they use? Is the world ready for a gay Kong? Uh, <laughs> ooh. Mm, good point. Well, should we, should we jump on to the, the new one then? The Kong Skull Island. Yes. Uh, which is the attempt now mm. to from what I understand, to tie into a wider universe with the yeah. Godzilla film that was released a couple of years ago. Yeah. And so this <laughs> is obviously why we, uh, we're we doing this episode of the show. It's our tie-in film of the week. But yeah, yeah, like you say, it's it's it seems like this weird... I mean, I, I don't know. I think, I think they were making Kong Skull Island before there were any firm plans to, to do a crossover with Godzilla. Yeah. That's my understanding, yeah. And then I think a, a producer just turned around and was like, fuck it, I want him to fight. Do it. Make it happen. <laughs> so yeah, I think somewhere down the line we're going to get a full-on Godzilla versus Kong. Yeah, yeah, uh, they've announced... They've, they've, I think they've dated them and everything. They're, wow, they're, oh, okay. Godzilla versus King Kong, I believe, is dated for... I think it's 2020? Hmm. Um... So, um, we've all seen the trailer for Kong Skull Island, haven't we? Uh, yes. yes. Thoughts? Anyone excited about it? Anyone? I, I'm kind of amazed that they've managed to make a movie out of Kong for so much money, like, sort of as if they're so <laughs> certain that they're going to make a great profit on it. I don't know, like, mm. I, I, I want to save a full analysis for Godzilla when we inevitably get to yeah, it when the sequel yeah. comes out. But from what I understand, yeah. that movie didn't necessarily do amazing business. Yeah. And yeah, the I specific don't really... rim, I don't know how much these sort of big robot mm. monster movies connect with an audience outside of well, Transformers. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I will say that from what I saw in the trailer, I mean, it looks like it does what it sets out to in terms of the visuals of it. Um, you know, it looks spot on if you're into that sort of thing. Is it going to be very kind of by the numbers action stuff, or I mean, they, they've got some serious acting chops in in there, which suggests yeah, they're the, trying to do something with the actors as well. It's it's very odd. I, I watched the trailer, and it was one of the weirdest trailers I can remember watching in recent times. To be honest, I I just don't really know what to make of the whole thing because it's got quite a light hearted comedic tone. But that's not really what I expect from this sort of thing. I, I was expecting dark and gritty, and it feels more like a... I don't know, it feels like it's going to be a lot more light-hearted, self-aware, silly, campy, and mm. embracing how silly it is. And I suppose maybe that is the right direction to go if, you, if you're leading up to a Godzilla crossover film. What's, what's, what's going on with Samuel L. Jackson? He's, he's about 72 now. He shouldn't be running around doing action <laughs> films now. He needs to slow He down. doesn't age. I'm I'm perfectly happy for him to be doing this sort of thing. I, I, yeah, but surely yeah. at his age, you've got to be more careful. I mean, one he's Mr. Glass now. He goes over it. He's broken his hip. <laughs> well, we haven't seen the extent to which he's actually doing anything in this film. Yeah, yeah he'll true, be the one true. shouting at orders around, won't he? Yeah, he's probably the Nick Fury who just kind of tells everyone else what to do. Or they, they might deep blue say. see it and just kill him off really quickly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Samuel L. Jackson, I the man can do no wrong as far as I'm concerned. I, I love Tom Hiddleston and John C. Riley, as I think I may have said in a previous episode, I'm not sure, but John C. Riley might well be my favourite working actor. Like I think he's brilliant. And then there's John Goodman, of course, who again, mm. like the man can do very little wrong. <laughs> um he did have that that Flintstones movie. <laughs> oh, what? He was born to play that role. Yeah, of of its time and of where his career was at the time makes absolute perfect sense. Right, Calvin, you yeah, give yes. us your pitch to a sequel to King Kong. Yes, I will. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm doing a direct sequel to the 1933 King Kong uh, set in contemporary times because oh. none of the films seem to want to go past the 70s. 
Uh, <laughs> and I'm assuming that we've touched on this in our discussion, but I'm assuming that so much of that is because how can you justify characters in the modern world not knowing mm. that this island is out there with all these dinosaurs and massive yeah. gorillas on? So I would want to carry on immediately after, well, in, in the same universe as the 1933 Kong and see how the world would have changed as a result of that. So obviously word would have gotten out about this island in the middle of the Pacific with dinosaurs and the like on it. So for about a decade or so, there was there would have been a lot of conflict over who owned that island and what to do with it, etc. For a while, circuses would tour with captured monsters in cages and things. Some of the dinosaurs were taken to zoos around the world. Um, but largely, the island would have been subject to ferocious hunting and natural resource stripping, while uh, countries and uh, territories decide who actually owns the place. Uh, so that's do, a- do the natives not own it? Oh, don't be so ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's, that's never how it works, is it? Yeah, no. So um, so th- that's a bit of backstory, but our main focus is going to be on a group of conservationists who are travelling to the island um, in, in 2017. It's now a no-fly zone, it's a heritage site owned by the United States, and... Oh, I thought you said a national trust. <laughs> 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 Which... Would be quite funny. You know what? Yeah, that would actually be pretty good. Uh, but the, the 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 conservationists are going there to reintroduce giant gorillas into the wild. There, so you see, <laughs> Kong Kong from the nineteen thirty three film was actually a female Ooh. who was pregnant during the events of that <laughs> film, and later had three babies. And these babies are teenagers in Kong years uh, because. They could, you know, I know it's been like 80 years or whatever, but they, you know, giant gorillas, they have a longer lifespan, I'm sure. Just out of so curiosity, do, do gorillas typically have triplets? <laughs> Is that uh, I don't know. I Big suspect ones they'll one can do. I'm, I'm sure it's happened. <laughs> Big ones can do, I'm sure. Humans do it occasionally. I reckon an ape might have done that once or twice. I mean, she looked good on it. She was yeah. <laughs> heavily pregnant. <laughs> uh, didn't show it. She was massive, Alan. What are you on about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, they norm- is that how gorillas gestate? They go from a normal-sized gorilla to a giant 25-foot gorilla. <laughs> and yeah. it's just their children hidden in them. <laughs> it was No, no, Kong was actually three dwarf gorillas on each other's shoulders <laughs> with a big coat on. Big fur coat. So there are these, there are these three... Uh, they're teenagers in Kong years. Uh, they're, let's say they're about twelve foot tall, so they're not that big, but you know they're bigger than a human. Um, so it's one. Of, it's one of them like emo. Oh, the, sort of... they've all got different personalities. Yes, one of them is. <laughs> one, one of them listens to like Nine Inch Nails. Wait, can we? Can we? One, can then. we guess what their personalities are? <laughs> okay, <laughs> see if we can get them. Yeah. One of them's gentle and like inquisitive. Uh, and sort of. Wait a minute. Are they all? In, are like... they all boys? Are they boy female? Uh, there are. There's uh, two females and one male. All right, so it's not a gay one then. Um, <laughs> uh, one of them's gentle and inquisitive, I think. Yeah, yes. really. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah, arts and crafts. One of them's really creative. One of them. Yeah. One of them's a bit sporty. <laughs> <laughs> um, if if you sort of mean, you know, mean physical. Um, feisty. Yeah, feisty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of them's feisty. Is the boy really horny all the time? <laughs> no, no. The the boy's the fe- the feisty one. Oh yeah, well, same thing. Yeah. <laughs> then one of the girls is very gentle. Um. So the so the smart gentle. Oh, the one. pretty one, the sort of ditzy girl, bimbo. Yes. Yes. yes you've got it. Yeah. <laughs> She's kind of. How does that d- work as an ape? Well, she just falls <laughs> she over. Sh- she shaves and... a lot. <laughs> <laughs> So does she anyway. wear a lot of pink, then, basically? She may have a little bow. <laughs> <laughs> a little bow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so small, like... The, like a, a small by human standards bow. <laughs> why, why have you picked me up on this? <laughs> Let me have that. We've got to really get down to the details here. 
Oh, God. Okay. So they're going to take these gorillas back to Skull Island and reintroduce them to the wild in an attempt to reestablish the delicate ecosystem of this prehistoric world. Wait a minute. I am I'm seeing in the future here some incestuous monkey breeding. Uh, we're going to we're going to kind of gloss over that. We have uh, to. Like the Bible. For the scene. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. Anyway, now we we int- we obviously need some humans in this. So our main heroine is going to be Jill Denham, who is the great granddaughter of Carl and the current head of the Denham Foundation, which is a conservation charity. It turns out that Denham was traumatized by what he caused in New York in 1933, and he gave up the music business and set up the foundation uh, as penance for his crimes. He's dead now, obviously, um, and so Jill is in charge. So it's up to her to lead a team of about 30 people. Uh, we, we only really get to know a core group of about five of them, including another young lady who Jill can have a flirty relationship with and eventually get together by the end of the film. There's a, you know, there's we can have just stock characters here, pa- panicky science guy and grizzled old reformed hunters, etc. Mm-hmm. Um, so... So when Jill and her crew get to the island, we have about half an hour's worth of marvelling at the lovely location and stop-motion animation because I want all the creatures to be stop-motion animated. No CGI here. I Just because I, just I would be fascinated to know what a big blockbuster, uh, expensive, modern movie would be like if it was stop-motion creature effects. Um, through all of this, we'll have a romance blossoming between Jill and this other woman as our human interest story... All the while, the women bond with the con kids, um, who were friendly and not hostile, so have to be, like, shown the ropes, how to hunt, how to fight, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, uh, a bit of plot kicks in now, as it turns out there's a, a an evil rival corporation called Warred Inc., which is um, dead against <laughs> apes being taken back to the island, and in fact has been campaigning for decades just to get the thing nuked, and any animal that came from the place <laughs> should be euthanized. <laughs> this... <laughs> this team of people is led by a surly dickhead guy who in my mind w- would have been played by Vince Vaughn and... <laughs> well you're stealing my that's bit that's very good casting <laughs> yes. and of course trouble is caused when this evil group starts killing creatures and riling up the monsters uh, etc and they even end up killing one of the three Kong kids in an action sequence around this point all hell breaks loose, and um, Warred Inc. starts setting the island alight. They're in the jungle, they're, you know, trying to destroy the place. Um, they're killing people from Denim Corp, and generally trying to destroy everything they see. Jill and her girlfriend make it into the jungle with the two surviving Kongs, and we can have lots of animal fights and stuff here as the Kongs learn how to be tough. Eventually, they come across the original King Kong's cave, and there's a tender moment here when they see that, you know, there was some drawings that Kong had done on the roof of this cave, all very primitive, but they contain a conceptual family portrait. Her and her three kids, because obviously she knew she was pregnant, we have a tender moment here. And then Vince Vaughn comes in and chloroforms the quartet of heroes, (laughs) and they're knocked out. When Jill awakes, she's in this luxury setting, she's on a boat, she's at sea. She looks around, and there are a bunch of armed guards and healthcare providers around her, and at the very bottom of this giant room... Uh, being helped out of bed is a 110 year old Anne Darrow from the first movie. <laughs> it turns out that in a Prometheus like twist, that uh, e- everyone thought that this old lady was dead, but actually she's dedicated her life to hateful vengeance against everything from the island and now <laughs> seeks to destroy the last of Kong's legacy and set off an atomic bomb which would completely destroy Skull Island and everything in a 10 mile radius. So now we have a great third act climax. <laughs> As Jill and her girlfriend fight to release the Kongs, who must stop the atomic bomb being launched at the island while Andarrow uses her robotic ergonomic suit to fight with the apes and humans, much like the old guy at the end of Wolverine. And, uh, but of course, she she is overcome. You mean Hugh Jackman? (laughs) No, no, there's the old guy at the end of the Wolverine. Hugh Jackman? No. Patrick Stewart? The old Japanese man. (laughs) Uh, Anyway... Uh, and Dara is uh, eventually overcome as uh, another one of the Kongs gives her own life to divert the atomic bomb away from Skull Island. We end the film with Jill reintroducing the last Kong, the male, into the wild and turning to leave uh, leave it to nature. She's holding hands with the girlfriend. They're going off into the sunset. And uh, just as the camera pans away and oop, maybe we see another, like, you know, a little Kong hand pop up from behind a bush implying <laughs> that there's actually more on the island and there can be more baby Kongs in the future. 
Anyway, yeah, there we go. That's my pitch. Uh, yeah. I think it should have a bit where they have to, um, they're trying to leave the Kong on the island and they have to like be really mean to it to make it go away and stop. <laughs> 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 oh dear. Yeah. Sol, do you want to go next? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do mine. Okay, so it's it's about another expedition to Skull Island. This time because the uh, the government, having seen all the... Uh, the stuff's real. They want to catalogue the place properly, so that's that's similar. I guess it's kind of like a direct sequel to any of the uh, King Kong films. You can take your pick. Mm. They get there, and the, the scientists are ecstatic to catalogue everything and do research and, and all that sort of stuff. There are some anthropologists and who, who are there to, to form a kind of country-to-country relationship with the locals and, you know, set up some trade links, communication, all that stuff. The main character is an anthropologist who's who's working with a linguist uh, and some other scientist on these sort of social sides of it all. Um, and there's also like a really shifty guy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, they spend time with the the native people, learning their ways, going on expeditions with them to harvest honey from from giant bees and uh, <laughs> m- milking giant cows and, and that and that sort of thing. And, and at one point they go on a, a miniature elephant hunt just to establish that it's not everything's massive. Some stuff's like <laughs> it's small <topsy-turvy>. as well. Turvy. <laughs> but you, what, I mean, why is the ape so big? Like, because <laughs> like dinosaur, it's not like the dinosaurs are that much bigger than they actually are. Yeah, well, they're bigger than our lizards. <laughs> True. <laughs> True. Yeah. What does he eat today? That's a lot of bamboo. Dinosaurs. He eats like natives. They like sacrifice him one every now and then. But well, gorillas are vegetarian. But that's... are they? Even, yeah. But even Don't they even eat if each he other eats sometimes? the odd native, that's not a lot of. Are gorillas vegetarian? Yeah. I think they. I think they're omnivores, I'm... aren't they? Yeah, I thought. I thought they like frequently ate other gorillas when they like died and stuff. Maybe that's just chimps. Mm, chimps. Right. I'm yeah, chimps eat this. monkeys and stuff. Oh, yeah. chimps are horrible things. <laughs> Tell you what though, how how good would King Kong be if they remade it exactly the same, but he was just a chimp instead of a gorilla? <laughs> a giant chimp. I love chimps. <laughs> what if he was a giant sloth? No, no, he's lost me. <laughs> just clings to the Empire State Building for seven months. <laughs> no, but imagine if it was a chimp and it's wearing a big nappy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, Alan, you're right. It just seemed like they own the um, oh. veg and ants. I was going to say, I'm sure they eat bugs. Yeah, ants. Yeah, there you go. So, that's a, so a big one is probably start eating people, because that's like an ant to them. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. And good logic. Yeah. But the, anyway, then it turns out that the uh, the shifty guy was sent by the military, which is the real reason the government is funding everything. Mm. Um, he's been sent there to steal some baby Kongs from the uh, nest <laughs> to take them home to be weaponized. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, who would who would you have playing the shifty guy? The shifty guy, um, Matthew Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> okay. Oh yes, yes. Is he? I don't think he'd do he's it. He's too likable. <laughs> uh, did it. So yeah, the people show them where the baby Kongs live, and everything goes wrong because they they force their way past a native sacred barrier designed to keep the balance between their people and the apes. The local scientists try to use the help of some dinosaurs and stuff. To stop the guy, mm. uh, but ultimately they they fail. So I assume they ride them like Yoshi or something. I guess that's probably what I meant when I wrote this. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, ultimately they fail, and they're left on the island as the bad guy escapes with a, a boat full of apes. And the bad guy takes the baby Kongs back to the army, and then the U.S. grows the monkeys into giant King Kongs, and they embark on an invasion of every nation on Earth using giant monkeys, and they're they're taking over the world uh, <laughs> one by one, and they they drop a uh, they drop a King Kong on Hiroshima, and the Japanese government are like, "Well, we're not having this, are we?" And the <laughs> Prime Minister of Japan opens up a, uh, a a special box with a key, and he slams his fist down on the red button, and uh, Godzilla sticks his head out of the ocean and roars. <laughs> and uh, that's setting up for the, the sequel. So I think that's that's probably what they're actually going to do in the new film, yes. to be yeah. honest. <laughs> I, I do like how you referring to it as a Kong, like a Frankenstein or a Dracula. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Good start. 
Uh, yeah, that does sound quite similar to what they're actually doing, to be honest. <laughs> Along yes. with the other giant animals and stuff like that. In the trailer I saw, there was like a giant cow. Is there, is there, are there other giant animals in the trailer? Yeah. Not like dinosaurs and stuff. No, there's definitely a giant, like, big cow thing with big horns. But it's like it's is a real cow. Oh. Yeah, yeah, they see it in a river. Oh, whoa. I don't remember that. That's probably why I wrote that they milk some giant cows in my pitch then, <laughs> and then just forgot why. <laughs> So, Alan, um, my pitch is, can be summed up uh, with this tagline, okay? Ready? If you thought Kong was trouble, wait till you meet his wife, Queen Kong! <laughs> Hell hath no fury like a gorilla scorned. <laughs> oh, no. I came up with this basic idea, but then I, I was doing a bit of research. There's actually a... There already is a Queen Kong. No. But it was... <laughs> it's not... <laughs> It's not very well known, so I think I can still go with it. But no, back when they were doing the uh, 1976 version of King Kong, there was like a little low-budget British comedy film called Queen Kong, which didn't get released because of all sorts of copyright infringements. So you're just going to stick two fingers up to Dino De Laurentiis and... uh... Well, I, 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 I think if I could get hold of this version of Queen Kong, it'd be great, because... From what I can tell of the Wikipedia article, <laughs> it's it's got Robin Asquith in it. I don't know if you know who Robin Asquith is, but he's the guy who's in the Confessions of series. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, you know, Confessions of a Window That's Cleaner. That's a series? Yeah, there was like Confessions of a Window Cleaner, Confessions of a, uh, I don't know, Driving Instructor. Dangerous Mind? You know that? Like that. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's one that of Confessions of a Dangerous Mind with Robin Asquith. <laughs> 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 well... Uh, let me let me give you some of the character names from this this film because I think you'll really get an impression of how good it is. Uh, so the main character Robin Asquith is called Ray Fay. Ray Fay. You see what they've done there? <laughs> oh. you see, uh, 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 uh. Um, yeah, and the and the, and the female lead, Rula Lenska, is called Loose Habit. Um, <laughs> now, maybe she plays a nun. Uh, that would be obviously a classic comedy name these are these are almost james bondian names in the <laughs> because there's there's one called i'm a good body oh <laughs> God. what does that even mean is i'm a name <laughs> yeah is that an acceptable name uh, oh yes so that they would fit seamlessly into any bond film i'm sure you'd agree um oh, oh dear <laughs> this I, I, i'm assuming this is the the on the island there's a character called Queen of the Nabongas. Oh dear. <laughs> dear, 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 dear. Um, is, do you, is do you the... think she's very? Um... I believe she's got some big coconut shells. <laughs> <laughs> I see Hattie Jake's playing that role. <laughs> well, no, she's not black enough. I think you'll find. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so my version of Queen Kong, which uh, hopefully is not too similar to that, but I've never seen it, so <laughs> let's go with it. The first part of the film will be, you know, after the original expedition that they discover this island, they get a, a you know a surge of explorers and hunters who want to go to the island and uh, you know try and bag themselves a dinosaur or, or a giant ape. Mm. Or whatever. Does she turn up holding a giant rolling pin? <laughs> Do you know what? I was so cl- I was really considering all those things. <laughs> or like we'd identify her as like a female Kong. By having a tiny bow in her hair. <laughs> oh, no. Or like she'd be holding a handbag all the time. <laughs> anyway, so you have this you have this whole sequence of the hunters, they go to the island or whatever. It's like I realised when I was trying to think of that, I was just doing Jurassic Park two, basically. So one of them manages to net a giant gorilla girl and they bring her back to America. So everyone in New York, they're a little bit touchy about the whole giant gorilla thing, obviously, because of the last time. Mm. But they build this spe- special extra high strength chrome steel cage for her at the zoo, and they bill her as Bride of Kong. Uh, and uh, Anne Darrow, she comes to to see her, the Lady Kong, and she looks sad about things, obviously. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> Queen Kong recognizes Anne Darrow as the home wrecking whore who stole her husband, <laughs> and in a in a rage, she breaks out of the chrome steel cage and and then we have another action set piece where they chase her all over the city and yeah one point Anne like has to hit the queen kong in the face with a handbag or something you know i want it to be very kind of (laughs) very stereotypical 
I was thinking of you kind of like the giant rolling pin kind of idea. Um, <laughs> to be honest, yeah, you, you got that one. Um, okay, so we, we build to another big action climax where it looks like Queen Kong is going to be killed just like in the original. But Anne Darrow manages to draw her to a giant landfill where they dumped the body of Kong. Uh, and seeing... <laughs> Seeing that's the thing. How, how, yeah. What would you do with that? No, they wouldn't land for it. They'd stuff it and put it in a museum, <laughs> yeah, surely. They like Lenin. Oh, that would work, yeah. I mean, I went with seeing the half-rotten skeleton of her husband. <laughs> but um, <laughs> you could go with, yeah, they put him, they sort of like <laughs> embalmed him and put him in a giant glass coffin for people to <laughs> come and pay their respects. Either way, exactly. <laughs> Queen Kong <sighs> sees... King Kong, dead. And we have a big emotional moment, and it's, we all feel very sad for her. And then, so the gorilla and Anne Darrow, they bond over their, their, their mutual love and respect for this, you know, this flawed Kong, but ultimately Aww. a magnificent giant. Uh, and he was a, a gentle giant in many ways. Mm. Mm. Um, they, had, they both had many special moments with him. So, you know, they, they kind of bond over this shared loss and grief. So... Mm. Anne introduces her new husband, Jack, and she introduces him to Queen Kong. They all get along very well. And with mm. nowhere else to go, Anne invites Queen Kong to stay in New York as their lodger. Because uh, they just <laughs> bought a new house. And then the very last scene will be of them. They're going out to dinner and Jack's brought one of his bachelor friends along to meet Queen Kong. And see if they can set up their single friends. Uh, and then, you know, <laughs> it all ends with hope for the future and... It's a sort of renewed spirit that gets us through the tougher moments in life. <laughs> it's just mm. a general, you know, the upbeat movie of the year. Oh, I really want to see her go on, like, speed dating or something. <laughs> you know, like... You know there was that Planet of the Apes sequel where they sent a couple of them back in time to 70s <laughs> Earth and they became, yeah. like, minor stars? Yeah, and, yeah I kind of see... I, yeah, I kind of see that. Uh, well, we'll be doing more apes in a few months' time if we do Planet of the Apes. I'll be interested to see where the franchise goes. What, Planet of the Apes? Oh, no, sorry, I moved back to Kong then. <laughs> okay, I was going to say, I don't... Hey, hey, there you go, that's an idea. Planet of the King Kongs. <laughs> yeah. Yes. We missed the trick there. So, what do you prefer? Stop motion, rubber suit, or motion capture? Let us know via our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Diminishing Returns Podcast, where you can also like us and keep up to date with all the latest information. If you're a fan of the show, then please do help us spread it around by telling your friends, or you could go and give us a rating or review on iTunes. It all helps to publicise us and makes us more powerful than you can possibly imagine. Do join us next week when we have even more computer animated beasts as we look at the recent spate of live-action Disney remakes. Goodbye. Goodbye.